Africa-EU partnership is one of the key foreign policy priorities of the European Commission. As close neighbours, the two continents have huge opportunities for cooperation, especially in the field of energy, and not only in solar, but in all renewable energy technologies. At the same time, the lack of access to clean energy in many African nations is still considered one of the biggest obstacles to economic progress and a better quality of life. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the growing urgency of the climate crisis have brought to light just how interdependent Africa and Europe are. This panel explores ways to strengthen the partnership between Africa and Europe and the role of organisations such as the Africa Union and the European Investment Bank as drivers of this emerging partnership. We move into another green sofa talk and we want to explore how we build bridges between regions, in this case, Africa and Europe. And for those who weren't with us yesterday, just a very quick reminder about what our green sofa stands for. In the good old pre-pandemic days, the SOFA used to travel from continent to continent as a platform for international dialogue and as a link between this forum and all the other networks and summits around the world that are also sharing our commitment to expediting the global green energy transition. Since last year, like so much else, the green sofa has gone virtual, but it is still very much with us. And in this session, it serves as a link between two close neighbors whose interdependence has been underlined not only by the pandemic, but also by the climate crisis. Africa, as we heard several times yesterday, is set for strong economic and population growth over the next decade, yet lack of access to clean energy remains an obstacle to social and economic justice. The EU Commission has declared Africa-EU partnership one of its top priorities. So in this panel, we want to explore ways to strengthen cooperation across the entire renewable energy spectrum. The opportunities are there. That was a key message that we heard from a number of speakers yesterday as well. How do we make the most of those opportunities? That's the question we want to debate with four leading policymakers who are working to do just that, to maximize chances for the African energy vendor. Ladies and gentlemen, we're also eager to hear from you, so please do send us your questions, and I'll try to bring them in toward the end of the panel, time permitting. And I will now keep the introductions short in the interests of time. Dr. Amani Abu Zaid is Commissioner for Infrastructure and Energy at the African Union Commission. Welcome, great to have you with us. Dr. Werner Hoya is President of the European Investment Bank, the EIB. Thank you so much for joining the panel, hello. Dr. Ajay Matur is Director General of the International Solar Alliance, wonderful to have you with us. And Dr. Mohamed Shaka al makabi is Minister of Electricity and Renewable Energy for Egypt. So wonderful that you could all be with us this morning. And we want to start out by getting a first take on the challenges and on where things stand in Africa as a result of the pandemic. Experts warn that Africa will be slow to recover from COVID-19, slower than in many other regions of the world which of course poses a real threat to socioeconomic progress. So what does that mean for green growth? That's the first thing I'd like to hear from all of you. And may I kindly remind you, dear speakers, that as always, we're on a very tight schedule. So I would truly be grateful if you would keep your answers to around two minutes each. Thank you so much for that. And let me start with Dr. Abu Zaid. Uh, really happy to join you on the green sofa, even though we're doing this uh, virtually. 
Uh, at the outset, I, I just would like to uh, maybe warn the uh, participants that you and I did not coordinate the color of our jackets. It so happened that we're both wearing the same color today. But uh, going back to your question, um, it, there is no doubt that the, the COVID-19 has exacerbated the already existing uh, socioeconomic challenges uh, faced by our continent, Africa which include poverty, unemployment, food insecurity, insecurity, climate change, uh, as well uh, as lack of access to modern infrastructure and quality health uh, services. Uh, the, uh, the pandemic uh, also uh, showed us, you know, the, uh, uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, uh, access to energy, especially in rural areas, knowing that uh, the health care facilities in, in many uh, uh, rural areas in Africa, uh, uh, only 25% of them have reliable sources of energy. Uh, however, the impact of the ongoing pandemic on socioeconomic progress of the continent has served also as a wake-up call uh, for African stakeholders to double uh, uh, our efforts uh, in addressing these challenges. Uh, we are committed in Africa to pursuing a transformational uh, green development uh, pathway that is low carbon and climate resilient, uh, which will also promote both economic and human development uh, as, you know, as our agenda 63, the agenda of the African Union. And why I'm saying this, uh, 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 and why specifically green, uh, green energy, because it also reminded us all of the issue of uh, uh, energy security. Uh, now that or last year, particularly when the, the supply chains were interrupted, we had to rely on what is available here and now and what is best than a, a, a renewable energy, which is readily available across the continent in so many uh, forms of renewable energy uh, available. Now, uh, at the African Union, uh, uh, we are viewing the post-COVID-19 or the recovery from COVID-19 as a catalyst for accelerating the green growth uh, on the continent. Uh, the energy sector uh, 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 and uh, Africa has ample opportunities to use it. I mean, as I said, a vast amount of renewable energy resources and the combination of grid uh, 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 and grid uh, systems are, are being, you know, uh, explored, which is important to address the twin challenge of development, but also the climate challenge and also the recovery and resilience of uh, uh, of the continent, which we, we already uh, in, incorporated in additional program, the PETA program, the program for infrastructure development in Africa, either in terms of, you know, uh, uh, green, but also uh, uh, the, the, rural, uh, the rural areas. Uh, uh, we are accelerating or intensifying many partnerships that we're having on with Europe in that, in that field, whether they are the, the exploring and continue to explore the geothermal uh, energy, in, particularly in East Africa, the bioenergy, the energy efficiency, uh, the, the single African uh, energy market, and so many uh, uh, other uh, initiatives. Uh, so uh, we are viewing this this uh, uh, crisis, uh, this challenge as, as a catalyst, as I said, and you say, experts say, well, let us maybe surprise experts and surprise everybody and uh, use this uh, uh, crisis as an opportunity to leave fraud and again, this time will be in the energy sector. Abu Zaid, and in fact, that very much dovetails with what we heard yesterday from a couple of different speakers, including John Kerry and also Demilola Ogunbiyi, both of whom said uh, this is absolutely uh, an opportunity to leapfrog and also to, pro to foster cooperation between African countries about best practices and different pathways suited to local needs. So let me move on to Minister El Makabi now uh, with uh, the same question about how you see the effects of the pandemic playing out in terms of whether it could slow the green energy transition uh, in your country and also in Africa generally. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for introducing me to you, to this uh, uh, panel. Uh, actually, uh, in, in, I, understand, I, I believe that definitely the pandemic uh, will have some effect. However, let me talk about our uh, situation in 
uh, example, uh, might actually uh, apply to many other places. Uh, we actually develop a strategy in order to uh, re- to increase the uh, uh, introduction of the renewable energy in our energy mix to reach about 40% by the year 2035. Uh, and we put a plan and uh, there is a specific uh, uh, addition every year and uh, to, to the, the renewable energy. We are following it uh, uh, to, to, the, to the point uh, such that actually we were not affected uh, very much in our plan by the pandemic. Uh, 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 we are working, and so far uh, uh, we introduced the, to the, to the uh, uh, network about uh, over 6,000 megawatt of renewables. And uh, lately, actually, we are going to even uh, to sign about 2,400 megawatt of uh, investment in the both uh, the uh, uh, solar and the, the wind. So definitely, it has not affected much uh, on our plan for the renewables. However, it affects actually our demand of electricity in general in the country. We were supposed actually to have an increase than the previous year by about 5 to 6%. Currently, actually, we are facing about 9% reduction than what we were expecting. So it has an effect. However, we are working uh, very hard in order to keep going correctly in our uh, program. And uh, let me just tell you, actually, we, uh, we, we established or we constructed the largest uh, solar farm in the world so far with uh, 1,465 megawatt uh, uh, in Bimban, and uh, it is working perfectly as 100% uh, efficient and all of it. So I believe actually in Egypt, if we stick or in any other countries, if we stick to our uh, uh, plans correctly and we make sure that's happening, uh, we can get over this in a very short time. Thank you for that. That uh, upbeat uh, message, and uh, I see that uh, the International Solar Alliance's uh, Dr. Matur is not uh, with us at the moment. I think we're having a bit of technical difficulty with that line. So I will go now to Vanna Hoya and ask you a slightly different version of the same question, which basically is this. In light of those challenges that we're hearing about, uh, the after effects of the pandemic, uh, shrinking uh, economies in Africa, as in so many other places. How is the EIB engaging with Africa under these circumstances when it comes to energy transition? Put it very short, stronger and stronger, because for us, the European Union, and that means also for the financial arm of the European Union, our relationship with Africa is of key importance, key strategic importance. For us at the European Investment Bank, the EU Bank, the the COVID recovery and our planet's repair must be two sides of the same coin. The the trillions of Europe needed for COVID recovery is money that we are borrowing from future generations, each and every cent. We cannot use those resources to lock in policies that burden them with a mountain of debt on a broken planet. We have a chance not to simply reset the world economy, but to transform it, and we need to seize that opportunity now. I'm often confronted with the criticism that the idea of linking up economic recovery and our green ambitions will hurt us, that a commitment to climate and environment means that our economies and those of partner countries will ultimately lose out. I cannot and do not want to accept this logic. If we invest well, climate protection, and economic growth do not stand in conflict to one another. On the contrary, I'm convinced that investments without sustainability do not create growth in the long term, but stranded assets. And this issue of stranded assets is something that is totally underestimated in the political discussion. The private sector is ahead of us. When the head of BlackRock writes a CEO letter to all his partners around the world saying that we must move out of unabated fossil fuels, we must avoid moving ourselves into a situation where we put things onto our balance sheets which in 10, 15, 20 years will turn out to be stranded assets. That it is an economic thinking, it's not ideology, it's good banking and good economics. So what does this this mean for our partner countries in Africa? I already heard the word uh, leapfrog polluting development. Yes, indeed, we need to leapfrog that and transition immediately to a clean, sustainable energy pathway. 
uh, the uh, European Union has the the expertise, the knowledge, the support, uh, the, the possibility to support the implementation of green technologies globally, and the European Investment Bank has both the financial clout and the uh, advisory capacity to help in this process. So we are ready. Thank you very much. And the problem of stranded assets certainly isn't something we were ignoring here at the BETD. In fact, it was mentioned uh, many times uh, yesterday in the course of our discussions, particularly discussions regarding uh, leveraging money for green investments. I see that we do have Dr. Matur with us again. So let's, uh, let's give this a try. And hopefully, uh, the technology is working in our favor now, Dr. Matur. Would you give us a, your perspective on what uh, the pandemic and the associated economic slowdown mean for the prospects of energy transition in Africa? We've heard uh, both Minister El Makabi and uh, Commissioner Abu Zaid saying they think, if anything, the uh, recovery from the pandemic offers opportunities. Uh, do you see it the same way, or would you say, no, there are some real uh, challenges now for the green transition? Okay, I'm afraid his line is still not working, very unfortunate. But then let me go back to Minister El Makabi and Commissioner Abu Zaid to talk a little bit about what you see as effective uh, a, a focus for green partnership between uh, Europe and Africa. How could an African-European energy partnership help to support green recovery and, in fact, maximize those opportunities you've both talked about? So I'll start with Commissioner Abu Zaid, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I mean, it, it, we are already collaborating and partnering with Europe on green energy and green energy transition. This is not uh, new. Uh, and, uh, and on a large number of uh, programs and initiative, uh, initiatives, I did mention uh, the, the bioenergy, I did mention the renewable energy program, uh, the ARE, the geothermal, the, uh, the PEDA program, and so many other uh, uh, large programs and, uh, uh, and initiatives. Uh, what, what we are now, uh, uh, and since last year, by the way, I mean, uh, 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 are doing is that we are revisiting this partnership, you know, to focus or refocus on certain things. And I did mention the rural areas, particularly the mini grid off grid. Uh, uh, why? Because this nexus uh, uh, energy digital uh, offers, you know, a, a fantastic opportunities uh, to accelerate and uh, the, the access uh, to energy in, in rural areas and the, and the introduction of the private sector. Uh, small and medium also in that in that sector. We are, again, revisiting or uh, insisting on energy efficiency being a low-hanging fruit, you know, uh, whether from production all the way to consumption. It's a, it's a fantastic opportunity, again, uh, to, uh, to help in that sense. And what is also being uh, stressed about in this, uh, especially uh, since last year, is clean cooking. Uh, and um, I'm sorry to say that it's often not uh, spoken or talked about in, in, uh, uh, enough as we would uh, uh, hope and think. Uh, 900 million Africans still use uh, very polluting uh, uh, ways, you know, to, for, for cooking, cutting uh, woods and uh, uh, firewood and, and stuff like that, you know, for, uh, for cooking, resulting in a large number of deaths, much more than COVID, by the way. We're talking 400,000 people a year. Uh, whereas the number of tragedies we've seen uh, for COVID uh, or due to COVID were only 100,000, which is already, of course, a big tragedy, but not to be compared to, to, uh, to issues related to cooking. So we are revisiting our existing partnerships and the large programs that we are having with our historic uh, uh, partner, uh, the, the, the European Union and other European countries, to, uh, to uh, address uh, not only the emergency needs, but also medium and longer term uh, uh, targets uh, related to uh, energy transition. We are making use also of the fact that the fuel uh, 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 prices slump, 
which works in the favor in favor of renewable energy because governments can now reduce the subsidies to fossil fuel and focus or reported uh, focus their attention to uh, uh, to a renewable uh, renewable energy. And I, 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 I again maybe in the discussion will will come to that again. Uh, the new element maybe in the partnership, not only with Europe but with all our partners, is to make sure that there is a, an important place for the private to play in, 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 in the energy sector at large in Africa. And we have excellent examples within the continent. And uh, I hope His Excellency uh, 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 Minister uh, Mahabi, uh, Hamas Secretary Mahabi, will talk about that because uh, uh, Egypt has a fantastic uh, uh, experience in making sure that small, medium and large enterprise private sector uh, uh, very much involved in the production and, and, and uh, distribution of renewable energy. I thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, I will put that question in a moment to Minister El Markavi, but let me bring Dr. Matur into the discussion now because I understand the line is working again, so let's give it a try. Uh, Dr. Matur, so far the consensus has been that, in fact, green recovery from the pandemic, as much misery and uh, economic uh, burden that the pandemic has caused, nonetheless, that the recovery does offer opportunities to leapfrog and also to to bring forward progress on renewables. And of course, Africa is blessed with a abundant solar energy. Nonetheless, as we know, the challenges of building a reliable grid for solar are daunting. And in fact, yesterday we talked about the fact that I think it's uh, 300 million Africans uh, lack power altogether. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of investments would be needed within an African-European energy partnership in order to try to bring that grid development forward? Uh, well, many thanks, and I'm glad that I'm finally able to connect. Absolutely delighted to be part of the Berlin Dialogue. Uh, there are two points that I wanted to make. The first is that we have various kinds of consumers, and what each one of them needs is very different. The second point that I want to me make is that ultimately the rationale for the move to renewables obviously is driven by the fact that it is solar, but it is also driven by the fact that, as was just mentioned, it provides cleaner kitchens, uh, it is more economical, uh, it leads to lower pollution, there is a greater autonomy, you don't have to depend on an external source to provide electricity. So whatever makes sense, let me expand a little bit. The first point I think that is important is every place has its own rationale. And I think we need to focus on that. And therefore, evaluating solarization opportunities for the region with, for example, us at the ISA with our members and partners is the highest priority. It is that benefit which needs to be communicated both to the government and to the people, which is why the acceptance builds up. That's the first issue. So in some places, it would be uh, solar parks and it would be the grids that are important. In other places, it would, could be microgrids, which could be interactive with the grid because grid reliability is a continuing issue. But overall, Building back better, which has been backed by the African leaders, championed by uh, President Ondimba of Gabon, is focusing on resilient infrastructure, food and water. And I think this is what is important to overcome the twin crises of climate change and uh, COVID. At the end of the day, what also matters is that we are able to focus on ensuring that in all of these areas, people develop skills and jobs. There's always this chicken and egg question of what comes first, the assets or people's capabilities. There's no right answer. The capabilities have to come a little bit before the assets come in. So I think one of the key issues in developing this market, taking advantage of the recovery, is to invest in the creation of skills. Now, these skills would, could be at the policy level, they could be at the banking level, they could be at the level of the people who design the systems, implement the systems, monitor the systems. It is this capacity building which I believe has to be an essential part 
apart from creating the risk guarantee mechanisms so that the commercial flows can occur into the into the investment in these systems. And is that an area where you would say that is uh, largely a responsibility for national governments? Or would you say there's also a, a very real role for an European-African energy partnership in that area of uh, skills, training, and capacity building? Well, there's a very clear need for inter-country cooperation, particularly cooperation with Europe, but also with other countries. I, for my own purposes, tend to look at investments in three pillars, three concentric pillars. There is the money needed for the transaction itself. In many cases, it is viable by itself. In many cases, you may need subsidies where the inter-country cooperation is important. The second ring fence around it, the second concentric pillar is around what is needed to make that transaction viable, the risk guarantee mechanisms, whether it's payment guarantees or whether it's policies or whether it is the kinds of uh, uh, mechanisms for ensuring that the payments occur and occur on time. These are jointly the responsibility of both the country itself as well as of its partners like Europe. Then there's the third ring, which is creating the infrastructure. This includes the capacity building. This includes the preparation of uh, the banking sector to provide resources. It includes the preparation of the electricity sector to buy this electricity. And as far as this is concerned, this, the countries lack the number of people who are trained in these issues. This can only occur through inter-country cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. I've got uh, one eye on the clock, uh, dear speakers, and I see that, in fact, we have uh, not a lot of time left, around five minutes. So let me come back first to Minister El Makabi and then go to Vanna Hoyer for both of you to talk a bit more about how cooperation, both within the EU African Energy Partnership, but also between countries. Uh, and, uh, and the private sector can bring forward uh, the green and renewable transition in Africa. So uh, Minister al uh, uh Dr. Abu Zaid uh, mentioned that you have found some very successful ways to co cooperate with the private sector. Maybe you want to start out by just telling us a word or two about that. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for that. Definitely, uh, in Egypt, we have a very big potential for renewable energy. We have land already allocated uh, for generating up till 90,000 megawatt of renewable, whether it is solar or wind. So, and we rely to a great extent on the private sector for the investment in this direction. We started actually five years ago, and uh, we uh, uh, announced about our uh, feed-in tariff uh, mechanism, and there was uh, a lot of uh, 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 success for that, uh, to the extent that we we uh, partnered with about uh, 32 uh, different international and local investors in order to participate in the job. And it has been already realized. And as I said, actually, it is the largest solar farm in uh, the world so far. Uh, in my opinion, when we work <coughs> with the uh, <coughs> European continent, you know that uh, Egypt is uh, uh, it's strengthening is its uh, own uh, uh, international uh, network in order to uh, really interconnect with Africa. Oh, sorry, with uh, Europe uh, through either uh, Cyprus and Crete, and then or Crete and uh, uh, and Greece. And the same applies perhaps to Morocco and many other things as well. Uh, uh, so I believe actually one of the good things that we have to concentrate on of the interconnection and the strengthening the network itself uh, all over uh, all over the uh, continent in order even to make sure uh, to make sure that Egypt could be one corridor to transfer uh, power from uh, Africa to uh, green power from Africa to Europe and to make money out of that uh, in order actually to attract the attention, we did uh, a lot of attractions. Uh, by the way, we have a sovereign guarantees issued by the Ministry of Finance in Egypt. Uh, we have a bankable uh, partnerships agreement. We did an environmental impact assessment studies ready. We prepared a detailed solar atlas uh, and wind atlas, which makes it much more easier for any investor to come. And I believe this could, this could be an example which can be applied to, to many other countries. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Minister El Makhabi. And now let me go back to Vanna Hoya for uh, final words, uh, as it were. Uh, yesterday, again and again, we heard many speakers saying, particularly when it comes to Africa, we need to see money on the table. We're talking about billions of euros in investments that will be needed for the energy transition. So what can you do at the EIB within this African-EU uh, energy partnership to leverage funding also from the private sector to really maximize uh, that money that, that will be put at the disposal of the green energy transition? First of all, we need bankable projects. When it comes, for instance, to the, to the electricity sector, to renewable energy, we need the private sector to develop that. And that requires bankable projects, that requires a favorable regulatory environment, and uh, we need to facilitate the private sector uh, in order to, to, to do so. That's the one thing. The second, and it is doable because the private sector money is available, but it must be channeled into projects which are transparent, which uh, show sustainability and uh, also accountability. And that is sometimes not, not the case. So secondly, uh, we, are, we are aware, and probably you discussed it at length yesterday, the enormous energy needs in Africa, in particular when it comes to electricity. If these electricity needs, for instance, are served, by dirty technologies, then the entire uh, SDGs will go up in flames. So we need to go in with best technologies. We must make a quantum leap in, in development and technology. And that requires a, tr a tr departure from the idea that innovation, climate, and development are, two th are three separate areas. No, they must be seen together. And if we do that, I believe we can come up with uh, creative results. And they can be very creative also when it comes to linking different kinds of uh, energy sources and this different kind of energy uh, grids or tra transports. For instance, together with the um, International Solar Alliance, we are just preparing for next month a study uh, on, the, uh, on the connection between off-grid solar and mini-grids. Uh, that giant study will, be, will come out soon and off-grid reaches the rural, non-connected uh, or underserved communities and we have always financed when it comes to off-grid on rural and fragile countries and areas. And what is interesting here is, uh, and uh, I discussed it with Dr. Mani Abu Zaid in, in, in Addis last time, uh, there is also a very positive uh, gender angle in this whole thing, uh, because uh, it's, this has this proportion of positive effects for women who spend more time uh, in the domestic environment and also women micro-entrepreneurs. So we have to see these things together from the different kinds of energy sources and ways of energy transportation and also from a social and inclusion point of view. Dr. Hoare, may I just ask uh, one very quick follow-up question with the re request for a brief response. Capacity building. We heard Dr. Matur talk about capacity building needs in the area also of training, skills, and so on. What about bankable projects? Do you have opportunities at the EIB, or do you work with partners who have opportunities to do capacity building in terms of bankable projects? Because this is something I hear a lot, that structuring those, those finance requests, those bankable projects, is also a real challenge. I see Dr. Abu Zaid raising her hand. So two sentences from uh, Dr. Hoya, and then over to you, uh, Madam Abu Zaid. We are not in the field of general education. That is also an issue that is, that is for instance, served by international political foundations, and they do a great job. But when it comes to make to give the necessary advisory capacity and to train and skill people in order to make or to set up bankable projects, then we are there to help. In EIB, the entire thinking of our bank since its beginnings uh, two thirds of a century ago is always to combine lending that is normal for a bank blending that is the combination with the EU resources that we can bring in and advisory capacity advising. So lending, blending and advising always go together for EIB and we do this in Africa as well. Thank you so much. Over to Madam Abu Zaid. Uh, half a minute, if you would, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, to, to the point that, uh, that was just mentioned about, about the bankable projects. Yes, we do have a facility uh, in, in, in Africa that is uh, uh, to 
particularly for that purpose, the, the preparedness of the projects to make sure that they are bankable. And the challenge now is to uh, package them in a way uh, uh, for them to be attractive to uh, private investments. Uh, in addition, of course, to the initiative that we have in Africa 50, which aims specifically uh, to address this point and to attract the private uh, sector, African and non-Africa. But I wanted also to highlight that uh, investment do not come in vacuum. We need uh, regulations, we need uh, uh, strategies for that, and we need also complementarity because our aim is to connect the continent within itself. That is why we established the African uh, single uh, energy market in, in, in to harmonize the policies, to harmonize the regulations across the continent and create an economy of scale that is also able to uh, uh, to attract the, uh, the private sector. And I, Melinda, allow me, I hear people keep saying uh, the needs, the needs. A need in energy is also an opportunity for investment if well uh, packaged and trust. So let us talk about the, 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 the opportunities and, and these fantastic investment opportunities that exist on the continent that, uh, and to work together, continue working together with Europe in order to, make, to harness this opportunity and make it work for our continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Abu Zaid, uh, Dr. Hoya, Dr. Matur, Minister El Makabi, for this very, very interesting and, uh, and thought-provoking discussion. We appreciate you being with us. Mm -hmm.